in the first scene that i'm going to read you what's happened is that by majority rule the three owners of little spinoza have decided to geld the horse there is it's often thought that that will make a horse behave better if he's already six years old and behaving really really badly it it's it's probably not going to work very well when medicine ed finally had little spinoza alone he tell it into him get ready son the women going to take your mad manhood he broke the news not like it was the end of the world and next come disease hospital cases and death but like it was a thing the horse ought to know the first cold had come and they were walking round and round the shed row in a silver fog that beaded up the cobwebs and the horse's eyelashes. Wasn't no idea of mine. I say, wait a short while, see how he do. Nothing ain't gone change that horse much at his age. I say he a little bit of a crybaby, that's all, but easy to settle once he riled. You'd be surprised, I tell him. Ain't even all that interested in the senoritas compared to what you would think. They don't want to listen. They don't want to take no chances. They don't want to lose their edge. I say, what if castration changed him the other direction into a chucklehead girl? <laughs> they start to laughing. Pretty soon they cackling like witches. Got me outnumbered, what it is. Medicine Ed checked himself. This was a stab back and two-faced thing to say about the women. They don't mean no harm, he added. He didn't want to be a wrong influence on the horse. What good it do if the horse love him and hate them others? They have business now. Little Spinoza, don't fuss. Matter of fact, he had to admit the horse taken to prancing and corvetting round lately, high in his nature compared to how he used to do. He was always in a good mood these days. Could be too good. Maybe it was the change in the weather. Maybe he don't rightly follow about his manhood. He always was a baby. He's scoping round at the cats, the raindrops pimpling the puddles, the sparrows hopping up and down and cussing each other in the eaves. He stopped and had him a long sniff of Grizzly's goat. Now that Ducey had the two horses, she bought Grizzly a $10 goat to keep him company. When the goat wasn't in the stall, he was tied up like now on a chain in the grass patch between the shed rows but he always pulled it out tight as a fiddle string if folks was around, for he was nosy. Medicine Ed returned to the subject at hand. It's one thing you can count on, son. When they gone, they gone. You never know what you're missing. <laughs> Only a thing you be lighter of heart. Anyhow, he's saying to the horse. First he spied round to see what devil-born devil varmint might be listening. A crow, say, or Ducey's slit-eye goat. You know I be a little of a doctor man. I take them things and do you good with them, you hear? You don't got to worry. You in good hands. But little Spinoza was only interested in that satchel-bellied $10 billy goat. First he jumped back like insulted when the goat lift his head at him and stare. What you think this is, son? Ain't nothing but a spotted he-goat. Good for nothing, save to be the horse's friend. He gone urinate in your hay and shove his head in your feed bucket and race you to your eats. You don't mind out, he win, too. You want that? Medicine Ed reached down and touched that peculiar armor plate forehead of the goat between his coin slot eyes and shuddered. But little Spinoza dance around and look happy and want a billy goat all his own. Skipping a little here. When Haslip, the vet, finally showed up with his little bag in the afternoon, in the rain, looking mud spattered and harassed, Ducey happened to have taken a ride into town to buy a pair of reading glasses at the dime store. Tommy, who had been asked to help if this happened, Maggie winced. Somehow she hadn't gotten around to telling Tommy yet who's all horse, little Spinoza actually was. 
paraded them all out to the grass patch at the end of the shed row where it was cleaner and they would have more room. And then they stood there in the cold drizzle, shifting from foot to foot while Tommy dragged away the $10 goat that Ducey had bought for Grizzly. They had forgotten about the goat. Maggie held the interested but unsuspecting little Spinoza, who despite his notorious encounter with a racetrack dentist, everyone knew that story, seemed more drawn by the weird blue crucifix eyes of the goat than troubled by the brusque stranger with the black bag. Little Spinoza was still looking over his shoulder into the empty stall, his own, where the small but smelly and by get goat had disappeared, when a little commotion happened at his neck, and suddenly the earth fell up to meet him. His blood turned to warm solder, his penis dropped limp out of his body, and his knees melted. He sank to the grass, his elbows and stifles drained away. He rolled over on his side. His huge tongue wanted to fall out of his mouth. He was not sleepy, but gravity had won a great victory, and he wished never to get up again. He watched incuriously as the two men went around behind him and squatted, and one of them somehow picked up his leg and moved it a little and held the great black riverine tail out of the way. There was a pleasant tinkle of metal a feeling of deep and strange but painless emptying, another not so agreeable snip-snip, snip-snip, two grayish-pink, wet, egg-like bodies sparsely threaded with blood vessels lay in the grass. That was it. Already his face looked less alien and goofy. They stood there waiting for his legs to come back under him. The queerest thing was the long, thin, infinitely elastic tubes hanging down like spittle from the shiny balls before Hazlip snipped them away. Maggie saw Medicine Ed slide out of the tack room and pick up the testicles out of the grass in a silver can. It could have been a soup can, nicely washed out and with a label neatly removed. And then he faded away again, presumably around the corner. She blinked. She hadn't known he was there. In fact, he hadn't been there, or Tommy would certainly have called him over and made him drag away the $10 goat instead of doing that ridiculous job himself. These days when Maggie was alone with little Spinoza, after he had walked or worked and had his bath, she rubbed him. She didn't exactly know the derivation of this ancient slang for what a groom is supposed to do to a horse only that that was what the old guys told people they did. Been rubbing horses nigh on 35 years now, or back when I rub horses for happy blunt at hot springs, whatever it meant. But she sensed a thread had been dropped somewhere. The route to some secret heart of this business had been lost. She didn't know anyone who literally rubbed a horse, not even old Ducey. She asked Medicine Ed, that come from way back in England or Paris, France or somewhere, when the thoroughbred racehorse run five miles over open ground, hills and stone walls and that, and come back half dead under a blanket to a barn with no running hose water, let alone hot. So they rubbed the horse dry and warm. Babies get rubbed, he added, if you work for a farm that got babies. Rich folks had babies. Tommy Hansel had the geezers of the trade. Back in Charlestown, she had hauled to the laundromat a bunch of old croaker sacks she had found in the Pichot's barn. They had been many times stained, washed, and dried until they were the color of a healing bruise. Long ago, someone had left the pile of them stiffening in a corner. But she figured that like the mysterious hand-tied leather netting hanging from a nail and the old wooden hames, Lord knew what anybody had farmed on that flinty spread before racehorses. They must be there for a reason, and they washed out soft and sweet. And now she rubbed little Spinoza up with them from his ankles to his ears. She rubbed in a round, hypnotic, finger-painting motion, but hard, 
feeling for some remotely erotic synapse of disease from the ends of her fingers into his bones and muscles, which wasn't as easy through the pink gunny as it had always been barehanded with Pelter. She had to slow down time, go into a kind of trance state where sweet electricity pooled at her ner nerve endings like nectar on the pistol of a honeysuckle. And then by running her fingers over the animal, she could find his hidden landing places. Not that these were jungle airstrips, few and hard to find. They were all over the place. But you had to approach the body boundary reduced to this one brooding spark. You dangled from a headland, black empty space rushing by, and suddenly you were across. The key was being tuned down so fine that you felt the crossing. Without that, your fingers were just dead prongs on a rake, and nothing happened. True, it helped to be stoned, which he was rather often. Zeno had left behind in the crushed trailer a chunk of hashish the, the size of a square of baking chocolate, the ginger color and yielding consistency of puppy feces, and Tommy had bought it from Medicine Ed, who had no use for that stuff, for a yard. Plenty of times they had a little curl like a cedar shaving for breakfast. Rubbing little Spinoza without it took more concentration, a willed death of talky ratiocination up there under the pigtails. She had to hang up on the telephone of her mind, and then it worked. Oh, didn't it work. Come to find out the dangerous speculation grandson was a pushover, the model of innocent delight. It was alarming, in fact, how trusting he was once you made him feel good, how forgiving of all the predecessor pain, how unsuspecting the joy would ever end. Unlike Pelter, who shot up out of her intimate handling from time to time, without warning, with a rip-roaring snort and the urge to do mischief, nip or kick, little Spinoza melted away into the dream of bliss. He let her do anything to him. After she rubbed him dry and warm, she brushed him deep all over with an ordinary charm, charwoman's scrub brush, then every day worked a little at his mane and tail, patiently dug through and pulled the, sorry, pulled the years of knots and snags. Little Spinoza stood for all of it. His dapples came up like God's golden fingerprints. He crackled, he glowed. Even when she felt the pleasure running along his withers and flanks and waves and literally crimping up his spine, he didn't protest, just bent into it like a ballerina in a pas de deux. Look at you, you big silly. How are you ever going to fend for yourself, she mumbled into the warm curve of his back. But then you never were a man's man either, were you? Well, I hope you can still run now that you're not scared. She looked him in the eye, and he blew into her face a great warm drench of hay flowers. <laughs>